Let us sing God Sent His Son, number 345. Uh, good morning to everyone that's young at heart here and far away online. There comes a younger person. <laughs> You're our official younger person. <laughs> well, you know what? I was just thinking, happy birthday, church. Did you know that today is considered by a lot of people to be the birthday of the Christian church? And here we are. It is Pentecost. And you know, Pentecost is a movable holiday because of Easter, and peonies are not always blooming at my house right at Pentecost, but they are this year, and I love peonies. <coughs> In German, the word Pentecost is Pfingsten, and these flowers are called Pfingstrosen, which translates as Pentecost roses. Isn't that a beautiful name? It's so much more beautiful Pentecost roses than peonies are. And um, I love them, I love the smell. I don't like the little ants in them, but they're necessary, so I hope all the ants are gone. But um, Pastor Sue is going to show us a little video, I think, immediately after I say a few words about Pentecost, so I'm not gonna tell about the whole story, but there were some things that I was wondering about. Um, you know, why were all these um, Jewish-speaking men, or these different Jewish people, why were they gathered in Jerusalem just at that particular time? It's because they were celebrating a holiday, which was already established within Judaism, and they came from all over the known world at that time, which was not by any stretch of the imagination the whole world, but just the known world at that time. But yet they spoke different languages. And um, as somebody who was a language teacher and loves languages, I thought, well, you know, Pentecost, that was really a good deal. Because here were all these people. The apostles no longer had Jesus to help them, give them strength to spread the word of God. But, the, but Jesus had promised that the Holy Spirit would come down. And, of course, the Holy Spirit came down that day. And one of the things is that the apostles suddenly were speaking different languages. And they could speak the languages of these different visitors from different parts of the known world. And, who, and these people were obviously worrying, you know, were wondering about this. But I thought, man, you know, today when, mission, when missionaries are sent across to other countries, they often spend years learning the language of those people before they are allowed to go. But can you imagine if it just happened that easily that the Holy Spirit came down? Suddenly you didn't have to worry about, okay, is the word share masculine, feminine, or neuter? If I say Jesus loves you, do I need to use the nominative case or do I use the accusative case? They didn't have to learn any of that. The Holy Spirit came down. And one of the lessons when I was reading different children's stories was that it showed us that 
the, God, the message of God can be taught in all languages. It doesn't have to be just in English or whatever the official church language is. The message of God can be taught in all languages. So Sue's going to show us a video now, right? Yes. Language of love, right? Right. <laughs> love is a universal language. Well, this is a little different, but it's sort of for us on Pentecost. Still oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. What if I, told you I had it to the point YouTube has to, to get their ads in. Oh so my you can gosh. get off it. Yeah, we'll, we'll discuss that a little in my message. You might have noticed, too, there's a Pentecost offering in your bulletin for the Church of the Brethren. Does anyone have any prayers, joys, or concerns to lift up to us today? Thank you. Well, I feel very thankful. I had a call from Lori Thursday, and she said, I'm on the way to the clinic, Mom. 
I said, oh, uh, well, I have a cut on my hand and we can't stop the bleeding. I asked what happened. She was operating the saw to cut logs. At the V, the log pushed her hand. The doctor said he thought sure she was coming in with minus fingers. She was very fortunate. She has a swollen hand. The cut took two stitches and a broken bone in the hand. Wow. Uh, needless to say, hubby has said, you will not operate that saw anymore. But so very, very fortunate. Yes, that it wasn't worse. Well, we would pray for her healing and praise God that it was not more serious. Anyone else? Thank you. I would just like to say um, that I am thankful that Jem is feeling better. Praise the Lord. And we pray for his continued healing and grace on both of you. Shelly too. Shelly too, yes. She's in my prayer. We are grateful that whatever has helped with the pacemaker, but, you know, there's continued need for prayer in her situation for her health to stay better and get better. So please keep her in prayer. We're grateful Kay's feeling better and is here as well. Anyone else? You weren't raising your hand. Okay. <laughs> Let us bow our heads. A spirit of our living God, fall fresh on us. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear as we travel on this journey, walking with you and with each other. Help us to sense who you are, who you're drawing us near to. Give us courage to build relationships and draw on your word and your power as we gain a better understanding of your will for us day by day. We ask for your healing for Lori, for Shelley, for Jim, we are grateful that they are feeling a little better, Lord, and that your healing ways are seen. We have many in our midst and in the world that we need pr to pray for. We are still praying for the Ukrainian people. Lord of peace, find a way to bring peace where there is war, shalom where there is strife, forgiveness where there is hurt and resentment. We need your presence here, Lord, today and every day. We thank you for Sean passing his journeyman license, for all those who graduated and are celebrating for this Memorial Day, for all those who gave sacrifice to themselves, Lord, for our Memorial Day, for our freedom. We thank you, and we ask you to bless their fami families. We thank you for time spent traveling with family in this beautiful weather. Be with those suffering calamities and violence. Be with our leaders, help our city, our nation, and all of your creation. We pray all these things and more in the name of your beloved son, Jesus. Amen. Now we will sing Spirit of God Descend, verses 1, 4, and 5.
Today's good news comes from Mark 1, verses 9 through 15. I will be reading from the message. At this time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. The moment he came out of the water, he saw the sky split open and God's spirit, looking like a dove, come down on him. Along with the spirit, a voice, you are my son, chosen and marked by my love, pride of my life. At once, the same spirit pushed Jesus out into the wild. For 40 wilderness days and nights, he was tested by Satan. Wild animals were his companions, and angels took care of him. After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee preaching the message of God. Time's up. Kingdom, God's kingdom is here. Change your life and believe the message. Thank you, Cindy, Nancy. We're so glad to have you with us today. I forgot to mention you, so thank you. Thank you, Scott, for taking care of the streaming, Charlie for ushering, all those that make our meaning, worship meaningful. We really thank you. The passage like this passage, like last week, you can see on your breakdown of Mark that I handed you last week. If you haven't gotten one, there's one in your mailbox or there's one on the back pew. It's one of the major Bible stories, meaning it's found in the lectionary and often focused on in sermons. And I'm sure it, like last week's message of John the Baptist, is familiar to most of you. We left last week with the final verse saying that John the Baptist, Jesus' forerunner, sent to prepare the way, said to many, I baptize you with water, but the one who will come after me, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And today, as we recognize another passage dealing with the Spirit, when the disciples received the Holy Spirit, we're looking back and seeing the first entrance of the Spirit in the biblical text at Jesus' baptism, to give him power to do miraculous signs that we will see throughout his ministry, and to do what is also part of this passage, to pass a test of sorts, as he immediately is sent out by the same Spirit of God to the wilderness to be tempted. First, regarding Jesus' baptism, in our last scene, Jews came from all over to be baptized by John. Yet this was not the beginning of a great revival. In fact, Jesus was more popular in Galilee than Jerusalem, and the religious leaders there, we know, have become synonymous with his enemies. Yet per Timothy Geddard, this baptism is the one that makes a lasting impact. One that was not a cleansing from sin, but instead set him apart as the one whose faithfulness provides salvation for many. As Jesus emerged from the baptismal waters, we heard in verse 10, which by the way is why we practice submersion during baptism, it says the heavens opened up. This was a private event though, only seen by Jesus and narrated by Mark. You or thou is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, God said. These words per Gettard are allusions to Old Testament passages, by the way. Psalm 2, 7 says, you are my son, proclaiming a future Messiah. And Genesis 22, 2 says, take your only son, whom you loved, indicative of a son being offered as a sacrifice. And the third is from Isaiah 42, 1, which says, this is my chosen one, in whom my soul delights, I will put my spirit in him. These words are assuring Jesus of his father's love as he's being inaugurated into a messianic ministry by the way of the cross per Gettard. And Today I'm going to focus a lot on repeated scenes, scenes seen throughout scripture that relate to a couple accounts, and here's one of them. As during the transfiguration, the heavens opened up and similar words from God were spoken. That event was seen by three disciples, though, a little more public, we might say. Then there's the tearing of the veil when Jesus died, symbolizing how his death gave Christians a through way into the presence of God. And we know this was seen by others, and that a Roman soldier proclaimed that this truly was God's son. 
And in the end, we know that all will know this to be true. The song I played before worship, Open Up the Heavens, you may remember, is the one I played the week I came to preach right before I was called to be your pastor. And, and I preached about Jesus' baptism. It's a good song that brings the moment of opening up the heavens into the present to me. For we are not just to hear about past stories when we read scriptures. We are to bring the message into our present everyday lives. It says, show us your glory, your power. And we can also relate this to the song the praise band did last week, Holy Spirit. We want the presence of God, the floodgates to open, filling up our praise and our spirits so we can then turn and be a presence needed in the world today, led by the Holy Spirit, which I can say relates to the video we saw in Pentecost and we will discuss near the end of this message. In both Pentecost and here at Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit is described as a dove, such a fitting image for us as we think of a dove as a symbol of peace. And this is one instance in which the kingdom of God has come in order to, for us to have peace with God, as unworthy as we are. There's a much older reference to God's peace coming as to humans with a dove being a symbol. Remember Noah? In Genesis 8, when trying to see if there was any dry land after it was raining for 40 days and 40 nights, another repeated symbol from part of our passage today, he sent a dove out to see if it would return with any vegetation, thus being a sure sign that there was dry land and they could disembark from the ark. Now, the second time he released the dove, it returned with an olive branch. And here is the official symbol of the International Peace Conference, which is held during the first week of May every year. The dove actually used, is used in many religions and cultures including Native American, Islam, ancient Egyptian, as a symbol of peace. So the Holy Spirit comes as a dove, peaceful. But a dove isn't a tame animal, it's wild, or at least it should be in my opinion. And the Spirit of God, as we heard in John 3, blows wherever it wishes. It cannot be controlled. And this wild Spirit of God didn't let Jesus just rest in his baptism, the purpose of the Spirit was not to come and give him rest. There was work to do. And so it immediately sends him out, not just to do work, though. There was an important first step before he could go and do the miracles using the power of the Holy Spirit. He must go to another place, the Judean wilderness, in order to be tested. I've never thought of these two events really as being simultaneous. In Matthew and Luke, they're in different chapters, actually. Jesus is baptized in the end of the third chapter in both, and the temptation in the wilderness occurs at the beginning of the fourth. But if you look at the beginning of the fourth in each, it says, Then Jesus, full of the Spirit, was led to the wilderness where he was tempted 40 days. Interestingly, Luke says it happened during the 40 days he fasted, and Matthew says after. I suppose the point here is, that Jesus was hungry. And we know the first temptation of Satan was to tell him to turn stones into bread to fulfill this human trait of hunger. Mark's passage is a bit different than the other synoptic gospels, though. It doesn't give details of each of the three temptations and how Jesus responded. But it does say something not found in the others, that uh, animals were there. The angels are mentioned at the end of the temptation stories in Matthew and Luke but no mention of wild animals. I'm gonna show you this brief three minute part of a video to give you an idea of what the Judean desert looks like where this took place. What are we doing up here? <laughs> well, I wanted you to experience the wilderness. We read in Mark one, immediately after the baptism of Jesus, it says the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now, we're in the wilderness of Judea. This is exactly the type of place where Jesus would have been when this event happened. 
And of course, uh, today, the day we went, is tremendously hot. I think it was probably near 100 degrees. Even right now, I can feel the heat radiating through the soles of my shoes, burning and scalding them. I just hide it really well. <laughs> being out here and seeing this, I can really imagine Jesus being in this space for 40 days, the sun beating down on him, no food, no water, and during that period of time, Satan is tempting him, trying to get him to take shortcuts, trying to give him ways out of fulfilling his purpose for coming to earth. One of the things he tempts him with is, you've been without food for so long. Turn some of these stones into bread. Right, as you can see, there are plenty of stones around here to do that. There are, and for Jesus, to be offered that shortcut, you know, you don't have to get back to civilization, you don't have to get back to people, you can satisfy your hunger right here. The Bible describes Satan as cunning, and he uses opportune moments to tempt us. And he obviously did that in this instance. Jesus was hot, he was thirsty, he was hungry, he was alone, and for 40 days, Jesus is being tempted by Satan. And so it was just, it was wise on Satan's part, it was crafty on Satan's part, but Jesus didn't get in. Well, not only was Jesus out there for 40 days, but he was out there also for 40 nights, too. During the time Jesus lived, it would have been complete darkness, with the exception of the moon and stars. And to be out there alone, I think, during that time, and to be considering all the things that not only the devil was tempting him with, but just the, the environment itself would have been very difficult to handle. I know growing up, I had a misconception of what the word wilderness means. I always thought it was dry and arid like it is here, but I always thought it was flat, sandy, like kind of like a desert back in the United States, but it's really not. It's mountainous. It's actually really beautiful, but it's completely different than what you normally have in your mind. Well, and it mentions there were animals, and we've seen some of those since being in here. Being in this space helps us visualize that, absolutely. I really appreciate you taking me. Glad to. I think one of the things that biblical students need to connect, a couple of dots they need to connect when they think about the temptation of Jesus, is that Jesus came to fulfill all righteousness. And so just like Jesus was 40 days in the wilderness, the children of Israel had been 40 years in the wilderness and had consistently fallen short of God's standards and expectations and desires. And so Jesus comes, and as he perfects all righteousness, he goes through this 40-day, this, this shortened version of being in the wilderness, and he does it perfectly. He never once gives in. He never once fails God. And it is one of the events that helps demonstrate that he's able to be our sinless sacrifice. I think that helped me picture a little better, and I hope it did you as well. The Getter discusses the two options we have about the mentioning of wild animals. They could either be considered a danger, something Jesus had to deal with to overcome in addition to his temptations by the devil, or they could be a sign of his authority. It may be a foreshadowing of the peaceable kingdom portrayed in Isaiah 11. The video touched on the animals one might see in such a place. I read an interesting art article by Fred Carpenter that discussed how the Greek word for tempt used here, perazo, is a legal word, meaning to make proof of. And he says the same way a prosecutor might seek to disqualify the testimony of a witness, Satan was trying to disqualify Jesus as being unlike any other human, to prove that he would fold just as Adam and Eve did in the garden. And interestingly, the same Greek word, perazo, is used in other scriptures and has more of a connotation of a test. Like in Hebrews 11, that discusses how Abraham passed the test of offering up Isaac. But God already knew that he would pass this test, Carpenter says. It wasn't to prove that he would, but instead was to prove who he was, a servant of God. And this section is similar in some ways and different in others. God is not doing the testing. Satan is. But God is allowing this temptation and testing to occur to prove who Jesus is. And maybe to drive him into the, into the human side of Jesus, that he has this power. And now has a complete understanding, going through incredible temptation maybe, of what we go through. So he could better understand us. 
So to me, this in a sense is now giving him a real understanding of his calling, who he is, fully human and fully divine, and knows that he has the power of God readily at hand, which he will begin using shortly after this. The wilderness has a double meaning. It can be considered a place of hardship, of danger, but it also can be considered a place where one can gain intimacy with God. The Israelites were sent into the wilderness for 40 years, we know, and they learned to depend on God by being provided manna and such on the journey. But they found God in the wilderness. We heard of John the Baptist in the wilderness declaring the kingdom of God to be on the way. And Elijah, well, he has two wilderness stories that are interesting. And when in one instance, he obeyed God by going into the wilderness and was protected from harm in a barren place and escaped being killed. Sometimes obeying God can lead us into the wilderness, a place we may not like, but what is needed at the time so we can be protected from chaos around us. And it could give us time to connect with our maker. We could take a quiet place in two ways, an article on Preach It, Teach It says. We can indulge in a pity party, or we can allow this time or space to be a venue to solidify our souls. Now, the other time Elijah ran to the wilderness to hide, it's he was afraid. And God went and found him there and said, what are you doing here? And then he instructed him to go on a mountain and led him to a victory. This time, Elijah chose the wilderness due to a lack of faith in God. He wasn't discerning God's will, but is said, assuming it. And I think we do this often. So we have to learn to be still and patient to hear the still, small voice of God leading us in his will. But in both stories, God met him there and transformed him both times as well. He met him where he was and directed him. Sometimes we need a solitary place to go. It may be considered a wilderness because there's no distractions, giving us time to focus, to pray, can even give us a new perspective on something we'd, we can't see in the midst of a situation. So if you find yourself in a spiritual wilderness, whether you're there due to your own failures or you feel God has led you there, you can choose to use the time well to listen for the still, small voice. What may seem like your worst moment may actually be a watershed moment when God is about to do something that will change your life forever. So embrace the wilderness if you're there. Some of us may seek after these places, or maybe we should, because we're too busy or distracted with worldly things, and God wants to bring us to a place where we can grow closer. Anyhow, Adam failed the testing of faith in a lush environment without any real need in the world. The Israelites knew that God was with them and had provided every step of the way, but repeatedly failed God. But Jesus does it perfectly. Passes with flying colors, we might say. Per Gettard, Jesus' victory over Satan in the desert both foreshadows and inaugurates God's final victory over Satan and everything he represents. Again, we see repetition of scenes, of symbols, repeated in slightly different ways, with similar meanings to be interpreted over and over throughout Scripture. Sometimes we learn what to do and sometimes we learn what to avoid in stories, but all point to the importance of storytelling. So today we discuss some scenes that you might be able to relate to your life, to your story, that God may want to use. Storytelling is vital in sharing our faith and important in learning lessons and informing disciples, which we talked about last week. First, we discuss the presence of God bringing power during Jesus' baptism, the heavens opening up. Can you think of a time in your life that was a pivotal moment where God intervened? What is the story God wants you to tell related to this? 
is we can share Bible stories with others, but even more powerful at times can be our testimonies of how God has acted in our lives. Maybe he's given you power to overcome some temptation. You can tell a story of how God acted when you felt his presence when you needed it the most. We also heard of how God's spirit led people somewhere. When in your life have you felt God leading you? Maybe it was to or out of a wilderness area of your own. One which in hindsight you can see was needed and brought you closer to God or revealed how strong you could be with God's help. What wilderness area did you not think you needed that you may not have wished to go through but can see made you more resilient in the end or made your faith stronger? And failures in times of the wilderness might be part of your story too. Just like biblical stories show us what not to do at times. And it allows others to realize that their imperfect lives or tough times may be a lesson they need to learn as well, but that they can get through and have hindsight to see the value of the wilderness. And if you find you're in the desert, in the wilderness, not trusting in God's provision, giving in to Satan's temptations instead of calling on the power of the Holy Spirit, let us also remember the power of insanity, the definition of insanity then, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. See, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness not just to be tempted, but to feel God's power, to know he could do it, and I believe, and to get a fuller picture of the path God had set for him, giving him purpose, to know deep within God would continue to give him power as he continued to do his will. Now back to the video on Pentecost and the message to the, to the church that we saw earlier. Go, get out of the building, it said. Be empowered with the Holy Spirit on mission in the world. Not that different than we see here with Jesus. The first words on the screen express some tough challenges the church today is facing, Right? It reminded me a bit of part of my message last week. Then it got to what might be needed today, pointing us outside the confines of the church building. Our comfy pews, prodding us to show up in the communities. The video linked the story of Pentecost to some big challenges facing the church today. Another continuing story of the wild spirit of God, sending people like it sent Jesus into the wilderness. It sent the disciples to go out of that room and into the community. The Spirit didn't come to keep them comfy. It said it created a new problem for them that they would have to go out where it might not be safe, but out to the people. What will the future of our story as God's church, his hands and feet, be in the world if we are led by the wild Spirit of God to build authentic relationships with those that come to our blessing box, to our garden, or anything on our grounds. If they don't come in, will we get to know them where they are? Will we join in with other ministries churches may be doing or other organizations in the community? Will we build authentic relationships with our own neighbors? And like the video said very fast on the screen, pray, love, teach, serve, invite. And that might mean inviting to get to really know them, get to see God in action in their stories, which we touched on a bit last week, and be able to share our stories like we've discussed today of how God is in action in our lives. And it said solutions are all around us. We have compassion, strength, courage, and stories to tell. Our problems, it said at the end, are not money, divisions, or arguments, and that's an easy scapegoat for us to think of sometimes, but instead that we are not sharing our stories, that the Spirit of God should come and compel us not to be able to keep them in, that they are seen in our deeds, 
mentioned in our interactions with others, that others see our faith in whatever we do. That was one thing that really stuck with me from attending John Duran's celebration of life at UNL last month. Scientists that traveled with John told stories that, and they said no matter what John was talking about, it could be bugs in soil, biomes, but you could see and hear his faith. John definitely had a way of bringing up Jesus in any conversation. And it's a testimony I think I need to hear and that I can learn from his modeling. That reminded me a bit of how we can sometimes put God in a box. But think of God's indwelling in these stories today. And we'll continue throughout Jesus' ministry, right? Jesus came to be part of the community. He didn't call people to an inward circle to stay inside and focus on each other or just focusing on God either. He called them to go out to the people. He announced a new future of an inaugurated kingdom, here and not yet. Getter discusses this in his commentary regarding verses 14 to 15, which says John was arrested and Jesus is now in Galilee, preaching the gospel, saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. Some versions say the time has come near. Gettard says the come near or the time of fulfillment can read time to time, regard time or space. It can mean almost here and not yet. The verb is in present tense in Greek, suggesting something decif- decisive has happened already, yet the effects will go into the future. Thus, Her getter, Jesus is preaching the kingdom's imminence or nearness and also just the beginning of its arrival. Some events are in the future of God's arrival of his kingdom, such as Jesus' death and resurrection. And yet it's possible for those who believe and repent today, he is saying. And repenting and believing are necessary preparations for future kingdom experiences for us as well the means by which God's kingdom can become a present experience. Lastly, what does God want you to do due to something you heard today? Who does God want you to tell about your story? And how can you bring up God where God is seen in someone else's stories? As we seek to see how God is active in other people's lives, how can we bring to the surface in our interactions with them wanting them to dig deeper or grow closer to God. Maybe there's a scripture you can look up regarding something going on in someone's lives or your own. Then you would have a testimony of the passage that helped you. I mean, we have Google for such things, don't we? Look up a scripture regarding someone's struggle or a passage about comfort or guidance. And then how can you show them that they are loved by their Heavenly Father? Let us pray. O Spirit of God, within each of us and blowing all around, help us to be led by you to what your will is for us individually and corporately. We praise you for repeated themes and stories given to us to remind us of how stories are so important to the spreading of your gospel and your love. Send us, O wild spirit, Give us willing hearts and able bodies to do your will, to spread your kingdom to those you see fit. Amen. Now let us stand and sing our closing hymn, Spirit of the Living God. If it's okay, we'll sing it twice. It's short. Number 349.
go tell your story and how God is in it and seek where God is in someone else's story. Yeah. 